I rise to move that the bill further to amend the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016 as passed by Rajya Sabha be taken into consideration. आप कुछ प्रस्तावना रखना चाहती हैं? Thank you, uh, Speaker, sir. So the Insolvency Bankruptcy Code. This amendment bill of 2019 seeks to amend seven sections of the Insolvency Bankruptcy Code of 2016. Actually, the sections that we are trying to amend are Section 5, Section 7, Section, section 12, Section 25A, 30, 31, and 33. So the main purpose, the main purpose of the bill is to further the object of the code, which is to ensure insol insolvency resolution of corporate debtors in a time-bound manner and for the maximization of the value of assets of such debtors. Most often, when a company reaches the stage where debtors' payments are pending, due to the delay in timely resolution, the value of the assets of such debtors gets depleted, it continuously uh, regresses in its value, and as a result, debtors find that there is no end to their problem. So the resolution itself doesn't give an answer, because of the delay. So delay is one of the very important causes. So the amendments that we are bringing in today aim to ensure timely admission of cases and also timely completion of the corporate insolvency resolution process, which I probably will frequently refer to as CIRP. So we want to bring in greater timeliness about the whole thing permissibility of corporate restructuring process itself, the scheme, the resolution plan which the uh, committee of creditors might come up with, and to make sure that the order of priority of the creditors, as laid down by Section 53, uh, is maintained, the security interests of the secured creditors are respected, and the resolve to voting deadlock like a situation where deadlock arises in certain cases the authorized representatives can come under section 216a and cast the vote so that in accordance with the decision approved by the highest voting shareholders more than 50 percent shareholders that is so the aim of one of the aims of this uh, amendment is to deal with that kind of a situation and in this case, in the case of the voting, we are trying to very clearly present financial creditors on the basis of those who are present and voting basis. And then we are also bringing an amendment to make sure the applicability of the resolution plan. After all, the committee of creditors, when they come up with a, a resolution plan, because they are the final word on a commercial decision, when they come up with the resolution plan, it should be binding on most authorities. Here we are very clearly, because of the amendment, saying that it shall be binding on central government, state government, and even the local authorities. So all statutory authorities will be bound by the decision which the COC brings in as the resolution plan. And then we are also trying to clarify that the committee of creditors may take resolution plan-based decisions to liquidate a corporate debtor at any time after their constitution itself. So if the committee of creditors has been constituted, they should be able to come up with a resolution plan that very minute onwards, any time. So even if it is before the preparation of the information memorandum, it should be their job to do it. So in a way, I, I want to underline uh, through the words of the Supreme Court, not exact quotes, but I like to refer to a particular case through which the Supreme Court really 
underline the fact that this code has really come to be a very effective tool in redressing creditors' grievances and the constitutionality of this code has been very well established through that particular case of 2009 which is commonly referred to as the Swiss ribbons matter. Through that matter, the Supreme Court has very clearly said 2019. Did I say 9? Yes. Sorry. No, 2019 is what I wanted to say, but if I said 9, I'm sorry. I stand corrected if I said 2009. I meant to say 2019. So in the Swiss Ribbons case of 2019, the Supreme Court observed that India shall no longer be a defaulter's paradise because of the introduction of this insolvency bankruptcy code. So we shall not be giving a comfortable haven-like situation for those who are defaulters. It also said very, uh, it actually upheld the constitutional validity of the insolvency and bankruptcy code, thereby really giving strength to the code on which it has been well recognized now that although it's only two and a half years since this code has come in, they have been necessity and periodically responding to the developments outside the parliament in its wisdom and rightly so has found it necessary to come up with periodic amendments and this is one of the amendments, this is the third time we are probably coming up with an amendment, set of amendments only to make sure that this code is going to be vibrant, it doesn't give itself or lend itself to, to any kind of uh, uh, interpretative uh, ambiguities and therefore the amendments are being brought in. And also, in doing so, and in, uh, in passing its verdict based on invoking the Swiss Ribbons matter, the Supreme Court also said that we need to move away from traditional approach in finding solutions for corporate, commercial and economic matters. And that is why this code on its own is one of the very effective tools, but periodically we are coming out with quite a few out-of-the-box solutions, but of course remaining consistent with the Constitution. So the economic laws the Supreme Court felt at the same time, felt economic laws need to have flexibility and also should do some experimentation. The Supreme Court had said that experimentation is sort of uh, something acceptable when you're looking at a situation of reforming the economic laws. So the main purpose is something which I have uh, very clearly stated. I would want to just go into the salient features of all the amendments that we are planning this time round. So there are, as I said, seven sections which are being touched upon for the amendment. And I'll just uh, highlight the larger context. They are largely uh, explanatory changes, trying to bring in clarity to the existing positions. So clarity is being brought on allowing comprehensive corporate restructuring schemes such as mergers, demergers, amalgamations, etc. as a part of the resolution plan. That's the first one if, uh, if the honorable members have got the, um, the amendment bill as passed by the Rajya Sabha, you will see that that's the first one which I'm referring to. Section 5 now will have mergers, amalgamations and demergers also included into the uh, description of what can come as a resolution plan. So the next one is greater emphasis is being laid uh, on the need for a time-bound disposal and uh, at, at the application stage itself. So we are looking at application stage being a very critical component. So if there is a delay, the usual process is 14 days by which time it should be admitted. But if it is not admitted even by the 14th day, we are requesting through this uh, greater emphasis that we are putting now that explanation be given as to why it is not getting admitted. So at this stage, without going further into greater details of the various amendments, Sorry. No, no, it is only for admission, we are saying, do give us an explanation as to why it couldn't be admitted, but that doesn't end the story, they can take a bit longer time, 
but explain why within 14 days you couldn't find it reasonable enough to get admitted for a solution. So it is only a stage to mark so that all of us in the whole process are time conscious. That's not to deny the process, but to say, give us an explanation. So that is one of the things uh, which we are bringing in. The third um, emphasis is on once the CIRP, the resolution process is beginning, we want the whole process to be completed within 330 days, including, including the litigation stage and also the judicial process stage. So then we are also going, I'm very quickly moving from one to another of the, resolution, of the amendments so that I'll hear uh, the members and in my reply probably give you a far more detailed response and answers to issues that are being raised by members. The treatment of financial creditors, sir, based on, since this amendment is coming in now and some of the amendments are in response to a situation which is developing outside, I want to say the treatment of financial creditors in one of the cases, I'm not naming the case now, but it's obvious I, I will probably, if necessary, uh, mention it in my reply. In one of the cases, the treatment of financial creditors as differently from operative creditors, which should have been the case, but all of them being treated at par, came up with a big um, uh, issue, people were worried, so we are responding with an amendment to that issue also. Then, there is a waterfall mechanism which is beautifully described under Section 53 as to who gets how much at what stage. And even that led to a lot of confusion in the treatment of different types of creditors. So we are reinforcing the supremacy of Section 53. Again, establishing that the committee of uh, creditors will be dealing with commercial matters and they are the final word as regards resolution plan. So uh, many of these uh, make the set of amendments that we are trying to bring in here. Uh, I shall probably go in further in detail a bit later, but for introductory remark, this should be enough, I think, and I'll keenly listen to all the inputs coming from the honorable members and respond to it at the end. Thank you very much.